I'd be grateful if you could turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. The text given to me was the first 31 verses of this chapter. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Our text from Mark 10 is 31 verses, three stories, but really just one theme, and that's the theme concerning discipleship. The bookends of our section give us the context. Verse 1, Jesus is journeying into Judea. Verse 32, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and Jesus' way is the way to the cross. So discipleship, according to the second half of Mark's gospel, is the way of the cross. That's logical and consistent. You remember how the second half of Mark's gospel begins in that very famous verse in chapter 8 and verse 34 when Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. So what does the way of the cross look like for disciples then and now? Well, our text tells us that it looks like the complete opposite of the human way. Jesus' way of the cross looks like the reversal of the world's way of seeing things and doing things. Jesus' way of the cross takes things upside down and inside out and back to front. And each of the three stories illustrates this. And that truth is summarized in the very last verse of the section, verse 31, where Jesus says, But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Well, there's a reversal of the human view, if, if ever there was one. In our culture, Warfare breaks out with cue jumpers when the last become first. Jesus' way is completely countercultural, as the summary verse 31 says, and each story illustrates this. Let's take the first story, verses 1 to 12. The story is about the very sensitive issue of marriage and divorce. And the verses here deal with very complex issues at requiring very careful interpretation and application. It's a way beyond the scope of this sermon. So let's just stick to the main thread in the whole 31 verses. And notice then that Jesus' very strong statement on the sanctity of marriage in verse 9 is countercultural. It goes away against the thinking of his particular time. Let me draw your attention to the trap question the Pharisees raise. And in verse 2, some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Matthew adds in his longer version, chapter 19, for any and every reason. Now we understand that there were apparently two schools of Jewish thought over the question of divorce at this time, one represented a stricter view and one was a laxer view. And according to William Barclay, New Testament scholar, it was the laxer view that prevailed by far at that time. There was a very broad view and interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, the words which say, a man may write a certificate of divorce if he finds something indecent against her. And interpretation of something indecent was, was very broad indeed. The laxer view uh, interpreted it as covering almost everything, including the wife talking to a stranger or spoiling a dish of food. And it seems that the disciples themselves were influenced by this laxer view because in verse 10 they, they seem to interrogate Jesus privately and ask him about his views. And Jesus comes up with a, an even stronger statement on the inviolability of marriage in verses 11 and 12. 
So much so that Matthew, in the 19th chapter, his longer version, adds in a reply from the disciples. The disciples, when they hear what Jesus said, according to Matthew's longer version, says, if this is a situation between a husband and a wife, then it's better not to marry. In other words, your standards are so high compared with uh, the standards that everybody round about us believes. Jesus' way, you see, is the reversal of the human view of looking at things at that time. And it's probably important to notice the distinction in Jesus' teaching on marriage between two things. There is, on the one hand, his teaching on the purpose of God for marriage at the beginning. Verses 6 to 8 refer back to Genesis 1 and 2 and God's original purpose for, for marriage that it be lifelong, permanent, monogamous union of companionship between man and woman. So there's the purpose of God, but we distinguish between that and his teaching on the provision of God for the failure of marriage. Verses 3 to 5 refer back to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and the provision made of divorce as a last resort. And it's very striking that even here with this provision, Jesus apparently equates the wife's right with that of the husband's in this matter. And that, again, goes against the prevailing thought of the day. So there is in standing by the purpose of God in Jesus' teaching on marriage, but there's the other side as well. The provision of God for failure in marriage and those engaged in pastoral work know that in our, in our fallen condition that uh, people do choose badly, make mistakes, change dramatically, fall out of love. For those who are looking for some kind of spiritual help, then we must, must offer the provision of the compassion of Christ, the forgiveness through the cross, and new beginnings by the gospel of grace. But what's Mark's point for discipleship here? For, for that's the thread, as I've been saying. Well, it's pretty clear, isn't it? The standards in marriage are laid down by Jesus' way, and they're greater than Moses' provision. That's the standard for, for those who are seeking to follow Jesus and serve him. Now, Mark's statement is particularly stark, but the assumption is that we know all about the exception clause in Matthew 19 and 1 Corinthians 7. And I think that Mark's statement is particularly stark and strong because most of his readers were Christians in Rome. And in Rome at that time, there was widespread immorality as there is in our society today. And it was absolutely important that they stood out clearly for Jesus' way of the cross in respect of marriage. This is the standard. And it's particularly relevant for leaders in the church, for those who are ministers and elders and pastors and preachers. Can't, the level can't be any lower than Jesus' way. And Jesus' way of the cross can bring suffering and hardship and tears. But it is a way that demonstrates the reality of what discipleship is in the day in which we live. Jesus' way is a reversal of the human way. And the second story carries on that theme as well, much more briefly. It's a story about uh, children who surely stand for the unimportant in the world. And that story is in verses 13 to 16. And uh, you remember how the disciples turn the parents away, it's, it's important to realize that in the Mideast mentality of the first century, children were completely, unlike our day and age, completely unimportant. But Jesus places the highest value on them. 
Notice a couple of things here. He gives them access to himself. The disciples reply to the seeking, inquiring parents, and they say, I'm sorry he can't see you, but come back next May, or words to that effect. And Jesus said, let them come now. Let the children, verse 14, come to me now. Mark tells us that Jesus was, was indignant. It's the only time in Mark's gospel that Jesus is described as being indignant. Why is, why is that the case here? It's a very strong word. It means he was absolutely outraged. Why was that the case? Well, because you see, the kingdom was at stake. The nature of the kingdom of God and entrance into the kingdom of God, which belonged to the little, the, the little and the least and the last and the lost. Remember what uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in his first letter in chapter 1 and verse 27 about God's choice of his people. God chooses the weak things of the world, the things that are despised and lowly, the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Apparently, this is, this is how the kingdom works. This is the characteristics of the kingdom of God. It's a complete reverse of the kingdoms of this world, isn't it? So Jesus gives access to the children. The second thing to notice is that he uses children as a model. In verse 15, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. He uses a child as a model. Now, in the antiquity of the first century Roman Empire, to use a child as a model was completely unthinkable. But Jesus does it. A model of what? Well, it can't be to do with the traits of children, the childish traits. It must be to do with the truth of, of, of children, namely that they are utterly dependent on their parents and always in debt to them, to parents and to grandparents. Over the last 11 years, I can't remember once holding out my empty hands to my grandchildren. And even if I had, it wouldn't have made the slightest difference. But I do recall quite a number of occasions when I've had to dip into my pocket as they've held out their hands. This is the point of the model. This is how we enter the kingdom of God and, and work in it. There, there has to be that, that helpless dependence and that huge indebtedness for getting into the kingdom. And it's the unimportant in the world who are ready more to acknowledge that. And, and you see how it goes against the, the whole trend of the way the world works. Entrance into prestigious golf clubs or, or famous schools. Completely different. And what's the lesson for discipleship? Well, it's surely this. Disciples who are following the way of the cross value people not because of their human importance. Remember what Paul said writing to the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 5, verse 5, he said, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And yet this worldly point of view of assessing people according to their importance stays with us even as Christians. I was made to think of this a number of weeks ago when I was visiting Oxford and went along to St. Ebb's Anglican Church in the evening, a very well-known evangelical church with uh, uh, a long history of, of attracting the students of Oxford University. They have four services on a Sunday in their central church, and they have a church plant with another four services, so eight services in all. I went to the last service at the central church, seven o'clock, 300 people there, seemed to be nobody over 30 apart from myself, nobody wearing a tie apart from myself. There they were, undergraduates, graduates, business people, uh, seemingly very able and very committed. And I went to Vaughan Roberts after the service, the rector, and said, this is wonderful, this is tremendous. What wonderful potential there is for the future. And he said to me, do you not know that Oxford has 140,000 people and the vast, vast majority don't know the difference between their right hand and their left hand, spiritually speaking, and we've got to get hold of them. And so St. Ebbs has a parish round about it, a very ordinary working class parish with, 
social problems and family issues, and they invest so much work in the parish. There's so many children there, and they're trying this and that and the next thing to get children in. And I took that as a, as a great lesson, a rebuke to me, a lesson of how discipleship, even in Oxford, where the creme de la creme exists, as we see it from a world's point of view, the interest of this church and its rector was on the least and the last and the lost. Discipleship means that we value the unimportant as the world counts it and their souls. Or put it another way, discipleship means that we are very liable to be ignored and snubbed by the important in life at the office, in the workplace, in the community. Jesus' way is the reversal of the human way. And that is, again, the thread in the third story. It's a famous story, isn't it, about the rich young ruler in verses 17 to 31, and he surely stands for good living folks. And you notice the disciples were absolutely aghast, verse 24, that Jesus turned this man away. If ever there was a convert, they thought, who was, who was ripe and ready for the kingdom, here was this man. According to the prevailing way of the day, he was perhaps there already, because of four things. First of all, he was rich, verse 22, a sign of God's favor. Secondly, he was religious, verse 20, he'd kept all the commandments. Thirdly, he was a great seeker, verse 17 tells us he ran to Jesus. Well, nobody who had any sense in Judea ran under the hot sun unless you were really, really keen. And fourthly, he was a worshiper. Verse 17, he fell on his knees before Jesus and called him good, a mark in the Old Testament of God and his attributes. So according to the disciples and the prevailing way of thinking, this man's really there already. Remember, they were called to be fishers of men, and they would say, well, here's a fish that's really jumping into our net. It's, it's practically begging to be caught. If the rich young ruler had been able to go to a Billy Graham evangelistic crusade, but when the evangelist gave the invitation to people to leave their seats, he would have been first down the aisle. He, he was practically ready to, design his, to sign his decision card, practically ready to register with a new membership class. And Jesus turned him away. Here was a man representing the very best, and that didn't get him into the kingdom. It's a reversal of the human way, isn't it? Why did Jesus turn him away? Well, Jesus says in verse 21, there's one thing that he lacked, one comprehensive, crucial thing. What was that? Well, following on from the previous story, surely it was, he, he lacked the empty hands of a child. You see, this man's hands were full. His hands were full of pounds and dollars and, and euros. Well, the last mention wouldn't do him any good. But uh, his hands were full of what he thought money could, could bring him. This was the thing that he thought about most before God. And what's that called? Well, that's called idolatry. Timothy Keller, in his great book, Counterfeit Gods, has reminded us, and we needed reminding, that the essence of sin in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, is that it is termed idolatry. That is to say, sin, essentially, according to the Bible, Keller reminds us, is the inordinate desire for something or someone other than God. It's the thing that one thinks about the most, the thing that one plans about most. And it could be anything. It could be money, it could be houses, possessions, sport, sex, leisure, entertainment, even family and the aspiration for children. If it's that which is 
inordinately desired and wanted and thought about most, then the Bible says that's idolatry. And Jesus insists that his way means that people must empty their hands of anything that is there in keeping them from having God first and foremost. Now, people like the rich young ruler, good living folks, when they hear the gospel preach, they hear the message as saying, try a bit harder. The rich young ruler said, what must I do? And it seems to me that perhaps on Remembrance Sunday, that is to say their hands are full of deeds and actions and energy. And the gospel insists that hands must be empty to recognize that by God's grace and Christ's death, it's all been done. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. That's Jesus' way. And so verse 27 is so key for understanding the nature of Christian conversion. For Jesus said it's absolutely impossible for a human to get in by his own resources. It's only possible by God's grace. And presumably he means by his coming. So what's the message for discipleship? Well, the lesson is that it is impossible for the Christian church to make conversions. Impossible. All the Christian church can do, all we as Christians can do, can teach and pray. Now we know that. That's, that's basic. And yet, how quickly we slip away from that basic truth. And somehow in our minds, I think that we can organize conversions by our programs. We can strategize them by our resources. We can almost manage them by our careful plans. But we can't. The only thing that we can do is teach and pray and then expect God to do the impossible with anyone at any time. And he can. And to encourage us with our praying, look at two points about Jesus to help us in our praying with, with faith. First of all is the look of Jesus. That's mentioned three times in, our, in this story. Verse 21, verse 23, verse 27. Jesus looked at the man, he looked around, and he looked at the disciples. That's to say, Jesus Christ, Luke, is a look that looks right into people and understands them perfectly. It's a comprehensive knowledge that Jesus has of individuals, and it's a precise knowledge with pinpoint accuracy. He knows the stumbling blocks and the sticking points. He knows the incapacities and the weaknesses, the susceptibilities and the idolatries. And it's this perfect knowledge that we must depend on in our praying. God, do it. You know everything. The look of Jesus. Secondly, the love of Jesus. Verse 21, Jesus looked at the man and loved him. Mark is the only gospel writer who points out this fact of Jesus' love. Jesus does not look down on this man in, in any way at all or disparage him as a good living man. And in no way does Jesus do that. He loves them. And in particular, Jesus' love is communicated to those who feel they're unacceptable. And he's, he's communicating that he accepts the unacceptable. After all, it was Jesus' love as Son of God which took him from the ways of heaven to the ways of earth and on to the way of the cross to suffer, bleed, and die that we might find forgiveness for all our sins and be accepted into his kingdom and be saved from his and the Father's wrath and saved for everlasting life. And Jesus' way and gospel way is the reverse of all the world religions and all the world's philosophies and all the world's messages. But as we close, let's ask, what, 
Are there any benefits for disciples who follow Jesus' way of the cross? Well, yes, there are. The last three verses tell us there are great benefits. Contrary to all human expectations about the Christian life and Christian discipleship, And yes, it does bring its suffering, and Jesus says here it brings persecutions. But oh, the benefits are enormous. A hundredfold in this life and in the life to come, eternal life, he says. I think I quoted before the words of Jim Elliott, the uh, martyred missionary in the 1950s. You remember his famous words? He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. It's important to choose wisely. And I wonder if there's anybody here who is not yet a disciple of Jesus Christ. If that is the case, I give you the invitation this morning on the basis of Jesus' teaching here. For the very first time to entrust yourself to this way of of discipleship and following Jesus Christ, trusting in Him as Savior and Lord, committing yourself to Him. And if you've done it as most have a long time ago, to do it again afresh this very day, remember to remember the great call to follow Him through life even unto death. We're going to be finishing by singing a hymn about taking up the cross and and following Jesus Christ right to the very end. It's a hymn that always reminds me of a school friend I have whose name was Brian. He he lived in in a house just opposite to me in Dundee, went to the same school. And when Brian was a teenager, he went to a scripture union camp and he trusted in Jesus as his saviour. He was a very quiet lad, a very meek lad, and uh, he often got laughed at at school and disparaged somewhat. He wanted to be a doctor. He uh, enrolled and matriculated the first year at university to be a doctor, and then he caught leukemia, and he died. And at his funeral, we sang the hymn that we are going to sing You know, the last verse of the hymn we're going to sing, Take up the cross and follow Christ, nor think till death to lay it down. For only those who bear the cross can hope to wear the glorious crown. Follow Jesus. May God bless his word to us.